I see that a lot, actually. It's like this digi- this idea of digital transformation driving a lot of standardized identity approaches. Yeah, and that seems like that kind of also. Yeah, because it's, it's when you get to the point what George was just describing where you realize, oh, like, oh, that's actually, oh, and they call that identity and access mantra. Okay, yeah, we need that. Well, the funny thing is, I mean, he, even at that point, we rolled out sort of a new identity platform, but all of the markets still manage their identity platform for their local applications, for their local PCs, et cetera. So we had sort of this dichotomy of the the global platform, which only got you into this extranet and subsequently any application that sort of tied in. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, and it's a bad result. People in Las Vegas, baby. Yes. Las Vegas. Vegas, baby. What happens, and this is what I realize, what, when you say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, you're talking about things that you do. If you see people randomly in public doing stupid stuff, that doesn't have to stay in Vegas. You can go and tell your friends, yeah, you know, they don't know you probably, and you don't know them probably, and they become a story that you tell everyone else. Remember that time of Vegas? I saw this crazy magician. You were telling me a story about a magician. Oh, unbelievable magician. magician. So we saw... Shin Lim, fantastic, you know, mind maker. Or, you know, just by nature it is here. Yeah, well, my nature is to try to figure out what's going on. How did he know that that person's birthday was X, Y, and Z? Or how did they, how do you know, like, where they were from? Like, he pulled one lady out of the audience and um, said, oh, your, your accent sounds like you're from Michigan. And then he went on to name the town in Michigan that she was from, which I had never heard. It wasn't like Dearborn or Detroit or something like that. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. And then we had a magician show up at the restaurant that we were at and kind of the same deal where, you know, he did all these tricks and I was like, wow, that's really, really tricky. (laughs) Stop sliding and in misdirection. Of course. Yeah. Get you the, you know, there's a lot of this like, Look at my hand, and like this hand's doing something else. So, but tracking somewhere. It's Vegas. It's probably like an explosion, and that there's something happening. All I can tell you is like this stuff doesn't happen in the dust of church or where else. I haven't run into it yet. So there aren't just random magicians. Uh, no, random magicians who just show up at your table and you know take your money and set it on fire. And you're just like, oh my god, I guess I'm not getting that twenty dollar bill back. <laughs> that's the only trick, right? It's where that blue going, where's my money gone? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get into it for this week? So we're at Identiverse. We're live. We're doing video for the first time in Identiverse. Hopefully it comes out. See, I'm um, We've got our guest, George Roberts. He's the Global Access Identity Director at McDonald's. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for taking the time with us. Uh, definitely want to give a shout out to RSM. Thanks for sponsoring us to get us out here and have conversations like this. Thanks to Cyrus Alliance for giving a place to sit down, record this, fix the plug in, right? All that good stuff. Um, but why don't we so just go ahead and get into it? So, Identiverse 2024. George, this is the first time you've been on the show. We all have to kind of about the history and the origin stories of what the heroes in the States like call it. How did you get into the wonderful world of identity next session? Um, so, I, I actually have a background mainly in software engineering and a um, number of years ago, I, I built what later became a component of McDonald's identity and access platform as as a consultant. And I was in a different role and then got an opportunity to sort of come back and take over the, the project that I had actually built many years ago. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. So I've actually been doing um, identity and access focused work for the last six years, but I've been kind of tangent to that from that year before that. So so I noticed you kind of ping pong back and forth boomerang, as I could say, where I was a year LinkedIn looking yeah. for ideas from this. 
you're at McDonald's consulting, other things, McDonald's again, consulting McDonald's. Why is it they keep plenty of that other than the French fries? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, a lot of us, we like to say we've got ketchup in our blood. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's helping you. <laughs> Probably not, but um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's a great a great place to work. Um, mm-hmm. The the culture is phenomenal. Um, you know, like any big company, there's always times when you, you know, there are outsourcings that happen and I just happen to be in the, the wrong area at the wrong time, I guess you would say. And on um, a couple of the, the ping pongs that you, you saw was when I had transitioned over to, um, an external provider to McDonald's. So actually, um, over the last like 25 years, I think I've worked for McDonald's as either a consultant or an employee for 21 of the last 25 years. So wow. I've been there a long time. What's the biggest change you've seen in your time there? Um, wow. I, uh, you know, I think probably in general for McDonald's is that recently we've kind of come to accept the fact that we're a, a technology company. Um, you know, a lot of, for a long time, McDonald's was technology was a, a, a cost center for, for McDonald's. Um, but you know, in recent years with the advent of our mobile app and our kiosks and our restaurants, um, I think our, our leadership has really recognized how much of a, of an advantage that really brings to us. And we've, we've kind of shifted our thinking away from technology being a cost center to being a business and it occur. You really have to have an app these days. I mean, that's what restaurant do you go to that doesn't have an app? I think you guys do a good job with that. Um, and I don't usually ask our guests for favors, but we did hear that there's a, you, you're headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, right? Yes. And so you have a, we hear there's like a test kitchen or a test restaurant with all the international offerings. So you can go to this test kitchen are you sure we're important plug you? Yeah, so our, our global restaurant, which is um it is actually a public restaurant. It's on our on a first floor in our um in our building, but it is open to the public. So if you're in Chicago, come come check it out. Um we don't it doesn't have all of our global offerings, but what they do is around every three months or so, they'll rotate um some international offerings in. So they'll usually have um, one or two of the, like the, the international sandwiches, they'll have some kind of like an international side, like maybe, um, uh, you know, different types of potato, like potato wedges or, um, shake fries or other things like that, where if you haven't had the shake fries, it's like fries in a bag with like a seasoning. And then you, you dump it in there and you shake it up and it gets all. That's not at all. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it is not a shake and a fries, although I'm told that dipping your fries in shake is also very good. It's acceptable. Yeah, I like that. Um, so tell us about your typical day. I mean, what, you know, specifically within identity access manager, what are the areas that you cover? And then is it like you manage a team that does those things or are you more hands Yeah, so um, I lead our identity and access engineering team and so basically my team is responsible for building, maintaining, enhancing our identity and access platform for McDonald's enterprise users worldwide. Um, so the way McDonald's operates from a sort of a day-to-day identity management perspective is a lot of that is done um, by our IT teams within our markets. We have 115 different markets globally. So sort of day-to-day management, password ch- man- password changes, et cetera, is done by the local markets. My team is more focused on actually building and running the, the identity lifecycle, IGA, um, you know, password resets, MFA, all, all of the, the technical work. And so, um, you know, we're always looking at, you know, what are the, the newest and latest and greatest technologies available how can we apply that to um, to our platform to enhance both the security of McDonald's as well as the user experience our users 
So within that, that store network, I mean, how many of the, the identity life cycles are you responsible for? Is it everybody from the top manager all the way down to the line cooks? Yes. So okay. we have two and a half million users worldwide. Um, and, and that's at everyone from our CEO down to our three people that are. That's a crazy amount, 2.5 million. Yeah. I, I bet you when you go out and buy some kind of software, like an identity management technology, scalability is a real issue. Absolutely. Like can, yes, I like what I see, but can you handle 2.5 million users? Yeah, and, and honestly, the some of the biggest challenges that we see are, are around the, the sort of the wide breadth of types of users that we have, right? Because, you know, our corporate users, our, our staff people, you know, people on my team, et cetera, they're they're using McDonald's laptops. They we have McDonald's issued phones, so we can we can kind of control what that experience looks like. We can enable mm-hmm. things like Windows Hello for Business, etc. But when you're talking about our crew people in our restaurants, um, most of them don't even work for McDonald's directly as an employee. They work for a franchisee who owns the restaurant. So we don't have as much control over what they're experience is like from a device perspective, right? Because they're, they're not getting smartphones issued to them from the company. We can't, um, you know, require them to use a personal device to be able to do things like MV and things like that. So that's where a lot of our challenges are is how do we, how do we build or buy a platform that is going to support such a wide um, variance of different user types and user experiences. Yeah. And, is your team like a 24 by 7 operation? Do you have people like globally dispersed or do you, are you able to grab a well from one place and just have people around the clock? Yeah, so we're on, right now, we are sort of hair, McDonald's employees, which are really focused more on um, sort of product and service management and technical direction. Um, and then we also rely heavily on partners. Um, who do provide that 24 by 7 coverage to ensure the platform is up and running, um, handle support tickets, things like that. Okay. So um, we have some folks, obviously, on my team in Chicago um, and other parts of the U.S. working remotely, um, but we also have a team in Croatia, team in India as well. A lot. Croatia, that's the first time I heard that come up as like a yeah. uh, IT hub. Yeah, it's one of, one of our... our key vendors is, is located. Is there a particular technology or area that really interests you right now? Um, well, I mean, so later this week, I'm, I'm talking, um, you know, participating in one of the keynotes on, author, on authorization. It's, that's a big area of, of focus for, for us is, um, you know, we've, we've kind of solved the authentication issue um you know we're we we rely heavily on saml and at um open id connect um and it's pretty easy for us to to onboard an application from an sso perspective it's kind of like doing 30 minutes worth of work you plug all the variables in and and away you go um but the authorization side is much more much more complicated um we you know we we look at it like to think it's somewhere in the 120 hours range on the average for us to integrate from an authorization standpoint an application and it's very custom um you know a lot of connecting directly to databases or god forbid doing flat file data um you know data transfers i, I mean it's it's across the all over the place um, so anything that is sort of aimed at solving that portion of the platform, I think is something that I'm super interested in. Uh, I'm also interested in, um, it, opportunities for other ways of doing MFA or MFA like activities, but for people who are a little bit more like frontline workers who we don't have as much control um, over the types of devices or the, the capabilities that they have. Um, it's a big challenge for us, you know, with as many, I mean, of those two and a half million users that I talked about, 
about one and a half to 1.6 million of them are crew crew members. And that can range anywhere from, you know, a 16 year old kid who's got their first job all the way up to, you know, um, somebody who is working in, you know, they've retired and they're, they're just picking up a few hours. Uh, you play have people with a lot of disabilities as well. We do. Um, you know, so, I mean, the, it, it ranges the gamut, right? You have maybe, maybe some kids who are more familiar with, with technology, maybe probably have a smartphone, but are, are they going to want to use it for their job at McDonald's? Um, and then you may have other people who, um, who don't, they don't have any kind of phone or, um, you know, maybe they have a, a old school mobile device that they can do texting on. But again, like do, you know, maybe they're in a country where they pay per text and it's like, well, can you, you know, uh, how do you take advantage of that? So, you know, we're always looking for, for new ways to try and solve that problem. What's your take on solutions like passwordless and I know the hotness of that stuff. I think passwordless is great, but, but it only really works when when you control the devices that the, that the user has, right? Um, you know, some of the, some of the, uh, you know, pass key support is, is really cool because it, it does kind of take away that need to a certain extent, um, for the user to, to have a specific type of device. You know, obviously I love windows. Hello for business. It's great on a windows, on windows laptop that has a hello based camera. But again, it only works really when you have control over that device as, as the company. Um, so things like passkey, I think are, are really good, but still doesn't, there's a lot of scenarios where like you may have 20 users use a shared tablet in, you know, in a restaurant, that's not a managed device. It's just some you know, an iPad that uh, a franchisee has gone and bought or an Android tablet that franchisee has gone and bought. And if they go and then try and access any of our web applications, it's, it's like, what's, what's the way forward on, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to try and do pass keys on shared device like that. Um, you know, not my area of expertise, maybe there's a solution for that, but, um, I think there's still a lot of the solutions that we see are are really great when you're in a, a sunny day situation where all of the pieces are aligned with, with, you know, everything that the vendor is, is expecting. But when you, when you kind of look past that and you've got, you know, heterogeneous environments or things you don't have control over it, it they can fall unhappy, the unhappy path. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I can imagine all the scenarios I've worked with another, uh, large best to the um, primary. And um, one of the biggest problems that they were dealing with was people who were accepted, they were supposed to start on Wednesday and they didn't show up. So going through that whole provision process and then, you know, basically they had to design the process from avoiding that being a big catastrophe because it happened all the time. Yeah. I'm sure you guys deal with that. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's definitely a challenge that we, we see in our restaurants as well. You know, I mean, if you think about it, I, 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 it's been a long time, but I can remember when I was a 16 year old kid, um, you know, a lot of times you go out there, Hey, I, I gotta get a job and I go and, uh, uh, apply for like, I don't know, three or four different jobs and whichever one of them calls me back first, uh, yeah, I'm going to go talk to them. But then the next day, some other company calls and says, oh yeah, we'll give you 25 cents more an hour that then McDonald's is going to give you. So then you just don't show up for, for your first day. Right. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting the, you know, when you're in a, uh, more sort of corporate setting, a, a lot of things are a little bit more standardized and it and they they work how you expect that to work you know when people apply for a job and they get hired then they show up for their first day and it and everything kind of follows a the happy path as you said yeah um but when you know when you start to get into you know retail type establishments um it gets a lot more dicey in terms of how that all works so we have to definitely design our our processes to account for that um and and 
No. Yeah. I would imagine it's a scenario, to use the term a lot, I am heroes. When you have that kind of distributed operation like McDonald's has, it probably comes back to somebody actually really caring who's in this location or even on your team who just like goes the extra mile to make it work, make it happen. Yeah, I mean, we've we've done a lot of work within our platform to try to address some of the unique business scenarios for McDonald's. Um, you know, the, I mentioned before that I had built sort of what became part of the platform, but it's basically a web-based portal that is almost a, a custom review into the identity platform for each of our restaurant organizations. So if, if I were a franchisee at, a, at McDonald's, I own several restaurants, my team and I could go into this portal and could see all of the user accounts that belong to my restaurants can do things like reset passwords, can reset the MFA for our users, can give them access to various different applications. And the, the nice thing about that is where we allow the people who are closest to the users to be able to try and solve those problems for them. Yeah. Um, versus making them call a help desk and, you know, then how do you validate that John Smith is actually, it's frustrating. We've all been through it, right? I mean, I had to get a, a power ship for the group today and I must have gone to four or five different people who say, good to that person, go to that person. They say, good to this person. Eventually you get to the right person, but by the time you do, it can be pretty, fr you can be already pretty frustrated and pretty angry at the whole process. And. It's something you want to put your users through. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, what we've found is that a lot of the sort of traditional uh, identity management tooling works really well when you're talking about a traditional sort of enterprise scenario. Um, but when you have a situation like ours where we have really hugely distributed environment, right? we have 40,000 restaurants worldwide, and basically every one of those restaurants is its own little business, you know? I mean, yes, some of our franchisees own multiple restaurants, but ultimately each one of those restaurants operates sort of independently of each other. You oh, know, really? Is that always, almost always the case? Well, so I think it's something like 93% of our restaurants worldwide are owned by a franchise or, or a licensee of some sort of McDonald's. McDonald's, I think, only operates about 7%. Uh, of our our restaurants um ballpark I, I i don't know what the numbers are they change over time as as we buy and sell restaurants but uh but the thing is yeah you may have a, a franchisee who owns five or ten restaurants um and they'll operate that obviously as a single business but the the individual restaurants themselves you know you're going to have a general manager and you're going to have other managers and then you'll have the crew and they operate that restaurant on a day-to-day -day basis sort of independently of the other restaurants even within their franchise obviously they have oversight from their their franchise organization but in in terms of how those crew members and the managers get supported it, it's done basically at the restaurant okay so you know when you if you have a crew person who's having a problem with their identity the first person they're going to go to is one of their managers and and we need to be able to empower those managers to be able to address and handle that issue as quickly and as easily as possible. Because um, number one, identity is not their job. Surprise us, right? Their their job is running running the restaurant, and so we have to streamline these things as much as we can because they need to get back to being able to run the restaurant. Um, but we also don't want them to be on the phone calling the help desk all day. I think I've just always been fascinated by the franchisee model or the dealership model or you know, the brokerage model, because I think to your point earlier, you were talking about with the device that you lose control of the device, the franchisee can go out and buy Dells or they can go out and buy whatever they want. Um, and you just deal with it. Right. And also, like within that network, I own 10 restaurants. I could, you know, have some kind of hierarchy. I could own a lunch of restaurants, maybe 
sure you have some franchisees that own like hundreds of restaurants, right? Yeah, I don't know what the exact numbers are. Um, at least within the U.S., I think our largest ones are somewhere in the 50 restaurant range. But again, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, you know, to some extent, we we do control the hardware within the restaurants from the standpoint of like our point of sale systems and things like that are are fairly standardized. There may be some options that the that the the franchisees have for registers and and other types of devices um and, and i think what we've tried to do uh over time is to sort of provide a standard set of capabilities so that the franchisees don't have to solve these problems themselves um and i think we've done a pretty good job of that mm-hmm. but to the you know for the most part i think in, in most areas of the world mcdonald's is actually on um, you know, provide not necessarily providing the hardware, but specifying the specification, and then having partners and working with those partners to provide those those options to the the franchisees. A uh, little outside my area of expertise, but um, I do know that for the most part, we standardize those things because otherwise, we you know we provide the point of sale software, we would be able to to easily support that if we were at too wide of a variation. And any other question, and this is probably way outside of your expertise, but maybe you know the answer. So when you're using the McDonald's app, yep. place an order and it says your code is, and it gives you a four digit code. Yes. All right, there's thousands of McDonald's restaurants, right? There's thousands of orders going in at a time. How is a four digit code enough to know that, you know, this is Jim and he ordered X, Y, and Z, so stand at this according to the code only needs to apply to the location wanting to pick it up correct um, yeah yeah so there are two smart people shorts <laughs> yeah um so you won't get the code until you've submitted the order and the order is going to be tied to the restaurant that you're submitting the order to so they really only have to support enough ongoing orders for that one particular restaurant but um you could have Theoretically, you could have code collisions of the crust restaurants, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be a problem because um, what happens is when you give them that code, they put that into the point of sale system, and the combination of the restaurant and the code then pulls the order in um, from the digital cut. That's my understanding. Okay, that makes sense. That yeah, four digit code wouldn't wouldn't scale, but. It wouldn't, but we, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you find again, to, from a user experience perspective, how do you find the right balance? Because you, wish that screen needs that thing you're reading out of, you know, 16 digit code. It's just, through a speaker. And yeah. It's through, no, 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 that was, that was an H. <laughs> yeah. Right. H and what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk a bit about identiverse. Um, I think we were talking before we started. We mentioned you were here last year. Yeah, yeah right. So this is your second at Nervous. Second. What brought you back? Um, I, I really enjoyed the the conference last year. Uh, I, I, you know, obviously I, I love um, being involved in any kind of, um, you know, community events, right? Obviously, this is a big part of the identity and access community. Um, and being able to participate in these types of events to be able to come and talk with people that are sort of working in the same industry. I think it's is, is invaluable because, you know, I mean, the, the sessions are great, right? Uh, you, you know, you get to hear it and you hear about, you know, new things that are coming and hear how other people have addressed problems. But we, even just if you were to get together or come and talk to the people, um, you know, walking through the the exhibit hall with the the sponsors and stuff beginning to talk to other practitioners in the industry i think it's it's hugely valuable just to be able to network and and uh make connections then you start to recognize a lot of these folks so absolutely they've been here for years and years or other conferences things like yeah that. so yeah the, the hallway conversations are always one of the highlights for me at least you know that's not something you can replicate right on like let's see or a weather or something like that. Well, and, it, and it's it's hard too because even if you even if you know and have the contact info for for 
some of the other people in the industry, you know, you know, they're busy, right? You know, that they're tied up with their own things and we hate to kind of like inject yourself into, into their, their daily grind. But when everybody has taken the time to, um, you know, to come to a certain place, it's a, it's an opportunity to really, you know, look here. Yeah, talk identity to meet new people, to learn new things, and see new things. All that kind of stuff. And we're in Vegas, right? So, you know, what stays and it stays in Vegas. And it may not stay in Vegas, but well, I mean, the thing that I've always enjoyed too is, you know, I I spend a lot of time on on social media trying to you know just understand what's going on and and see what other people are talking about. Uh, and and you have conversations with people on social media, whether that be you know through a, a public you know chat link comments or whatever or if you're having maybe even a, a direct private conversation but the relationship with that person changes drastically when you've talked with them in person even even if it's just like for a few minutes um i you know i, I attended a you know i told you i, I come from a software engineering background i attended a lot of microsoft events over the years um and i had been chatting with um, a, a gentleman from their identity team for months or, or even years on Twitter um, or on the service formerly known as Twitter. And uh, we had never met in person. And I happened to run into him at one of the Microsoft events and we chatted for him five, ten minutes. The, the relationship that we then had on Twitter subsequent to that changed drastically it was it was no longer just some random person that he was chatting with it was somebody who he knew who he had met and you could tell just it the the willingness to actually have a little bit more depth to a conversation so that's how it's that's very good like what's written because a lot of these um conferences well you're seeing it last they used to be there was a virtual option, right? First it was virtual only, then it was virtual option. Now you're seeing a lot of that go away, which makes sense. You, you know, people could travel and be together out. But the benefit is what you just said, making that connection. Now you're more than just a, a picture and a, a tagline on screen. You're a person that I've had an interaction with. Yeah, I honestly, I really love when they when the conferences do sort of a combination of virtual and in person because then I can go attend in person and can focus on the networking aspects yes. and not worry so much about the sessions because I can always come back afterwards and watch the sessions. That's right. Uh, like a, or something like this and you go watch it. Right. Well, because, you know, the, what's the difference if I'm there in person watching it or watching it recorded, but being able to go talk to people and actually have a conversation is a lot harder to do virtual or even split in between sessions, right? You wanted, there's like four different sessions all taking place, right? Like a lot of the, uh, I think it should be a mandatory thing. You know, if you're running the conference, you should have some sort of recording or something right taking place where you can watch whatever you missed. Uh, I saw somewhere out there, they're doing some sort of AI summer too as well, or other okay. things. I, I don't know what that means. You know, identifiers now with 100% more AI. I mean, you know what? I mean, if you swipe a little AI on it, it's got to be better. Right, yeah. It's got to be better. <laughs> Let's talk about your keynote Friday. Uh, so a time people listen to this, that I'll probably pass it blank. But the future of authorization, you mentioned early on that authorization weapons are really interesting. You're know, like a area that needs to be solved for still an employee or on that. Give us a little synopsis uh, of what the talk about it. Yeah, so um, I, I will say I am, I am a very small part of the keynote. It's mainly Sarah from AWS and, and Peter from my And Sarah's been popping her head in, by the way. <laughs> yeah, like, I see us like motioning us up like that. She can go across the I, I, I actually met with Sarah earlier this morning. You could go over the talk and she said, say hello. So, um, but it, so they're, they're obviously working very, very closely together on a lot of standards around authorization and um i where i'm participating is i'm going to to be the problem child um uh, i didn't but yeah um no i'm actually gonna just talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we see at mcdonald's with authorization i, I you know i think i mentioned earlier 
um, you know, super expensive for us to integrate allocations when it comes to authorization. There's a, a bunch of different ways to do it and none of them are white, <laughs> but, um, it, it's just, we, you know, the way I'm looking at it is if I, if I want to, if I were to have a wish, like I would love for there to be some way to make authorization closer to as easy as doing authentication mm -hmm. to a lot of standards. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. You can go to a, a, a SaaS vendor and say, Hey, what do you, what do you guys support for SSO? And they all go, Oh yeah, we support open ID connect or, and, or we support SAML and maybe some others, but those are the two that we care about. And, you know, you plug it in, it's a little bit of work for, you know, for our team to do, you know, 30 minutes an hour work of setup, you know, work with the, the app team and, and do some testing, make sure everything is good. And then, okay, great. You've got, you've got authentication ready to go, <laughs> but authorization is orders of magnitude more difficult. Um, and so the keynote really is talking about some of the work that's being done in the industry of trying to standardize, uh, you know, the author authorization story. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't think we're at a point yet where we go, Hey, we have a, a solution to all of these problems. But I, I think that what we're recognizing is we've largely solved most of the authentication challenges. Big ass area. It didn't even face this. <laughs> well, that was real interesting. I think from an authorization standpoint it is, I guess it's probably very, this is the first time I'm thinking about this, it's kind of where the you authentication know, issue was 10, 15 years ago. The problem, the problem is applications are designed to be standalone. Right. Like it's, if you have a single sign on, great, we can integrate, but you don't have to have it. You can log in on our screen and we have these roles or reaps or entitlements, whatever you want to call it, but it's this combination. And then that's what our application expects. Now, replacing authentication is just that thin layer on top. Replacing authorization or not replacing, but fully integrating to, and you have a number of applications all designed different ways. That's it's, it's a bigger story. Challenge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I, I think the, the, you know, sort of where we're at today is we're trying to solve uh, um, sort of that common language. We, we you know, with SAML and OAuth, you know, maybe Connect, we, we have a common language that we can use for authentication today. And when you, when you have an application, you want to enable it on SSO, you now have a standard, you know, you can plug in, but you're right though, that authorization is much more complicated because every application does its own thing. But I think if we can get to a common language or a common set of languages, that can be supported, you can hopefully get the application vendors to a point where they're starting to think about authorization in a consistent way because you have languages that work in a certain way. Um, because we didn't have those languages, everybody was left to sort of fend for themselves in terms of how they are going to do authorization within their app. And of course, you know, you, you have, you know, one problem, but 99 different ways to solve it. We, that's kind of where we're at today. So I think the first thing we have to do is solve the language problem. And then once we have that and we can show like, Hey, these, these identity platforms now support these languages. Now we can start to go to the app vendors and say, let's figure out how to get you on board because like authentication, it will make your life easier. It will make your customers' lives easier because they'll be able to plug in a lot better. Well, the good news is that folks like yourself and you know, others like Sarah and, and many, many others, I'm not going to try and go through the whole list, but there's so many people focus on authorization now. You didn't see that five years ago. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think if you look at it, the, the proliferation of applications is contributing to this, right? If you look 10 years ago, like our application estate at McDonald's was much smaller. I mean, you know, 
we still had a lot of applications. We're a big enterprise, but it was much smaller than it is today. We're for over a thousand applications. So Im imagine trying to integrate a thousand applications that are out doing their fate, the, you know, the, uh, their own way. And, and it's, it's challenging. Well, the next part of the puzzle of the software, right? We have fixed authentication. We're done. Great. That's not going to be that. If that's not where it's there, I just, yeah. What is next? Part of the authentication. There is the next step is authorization. So here we are with that frame. And, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit pessimistic because we do need outpatient developers to get out of this. Good. I don't know how we're going to go back and retro bit without some sort of crazy middleware. And there are some things that, that probably help that, but we're probably looking at what, 10, 15 years from now is really when we're going to look back on it. If we start now and say, let's start standardizing the way we do authorizations, mm -hmm. or at least coming up with some framework because you've got so many different ways to do it. Well, here it's transaction based. you know, maybe it's FAP, it's a T code, natural directory, it's a group and you know, another application there, it's SAS based app, maybe and it's a specific entitlement name, right? I just, I, I wish it would be get better faster. But the realist in me and the pessimist side of me looks at it like probably going to 10 to 15 years. I was apps have to pinch up. I mean, I think, I think you're probably right to get to a point where we're at today with authentication in terms of being able to say it's largely a solved problem, right? Authentication, we're not going to say like it's solved everywhere and for every scenario, but by and large, we can look at it and go, well, Hey, you know what? There's common tooling, there's common um, standards that people can use to plug in, and it's largely a solved problem from a technical perspective. Now, maybe not everything is using it, or maybe there's some edge cases. So I think you're probably right, but I, I, I think there's a lot of value even in, uh, if you were to get commonly accepted standards for authorization, and you were to get the identity platforms to support it, and even some of the large vectors to support it, which is probably what you'll get early on. There's going to be a long tail, right, of of applications. How long it takes them to to you know to bring out support for it. But I think you know even if you can get some of the major players on board, that there's a lot of huge value to that. Um, especially when you talk about enterprise type, you know, regulatory type applications, if you could get them on board, there's huge value for, for, you know, for industry for that. So you've got another step coming up this week because you're a busy boy that one McDonald's way, the global identity and access journey at McDonald's. What's that about? Yeah. So, um, McDonald's, you know, we, we're in 115 markets and historically McDonald's sort of operated as 115 different businesses. I, you know, I mentioned that I've been with McDonald's for a long time. I actually started in corporate in 2000. And when I started, there was no global IT. There was corporate IT, which was focused on like a main frame and our financial systems for, you know, how the corporation ran. And then every market had their own IT, you know, from the U.S. market, which had a fairly sizable U uh, IT because they're like a third of our restaurants. But you had some markets that it's like one guy in a, in a closet somewhere around IT through the entire market because they're a small market. But every market did their own thing. There, there was no, we didn't have a global identity platform. In fact, when, um, when I was fairly new. I think I was made company a, a year in. We rolled out the first global identities because we were trying to roll out an extranet and realize that we didn't have an identity that everybody could use to sign in to this this website that we were going to use to disseminate information of. I see that a lot, actually. It's like this this idea of digital transformation driving a lot of standardized identity approaches. Yeah, and that seems like that kind of also. Like, yeah, because it's, it's when you get to the point what George was just describing where you realize, oh, like, oh, that's actually, 
Oh, and they call that identity and access mantra. Okay, yeah, we need that. Well, the funny thing is, I mean, e even at that point, we rolled out sort of a new identity platform, but all of the markets still manage their own identity platform for their local applications, for their local PCs, et cetera. So we had sort of this dichotomy of the, the global platform, which only got you into this extra net and subsequently any application that sort of tied in to that same platform. But how people logged into their PCs was a completely different ID. So you had people with two different IDs with two different passwords. And eventually some of our, like the U S market and corporate said, oh, well, since we're running both of these things, why don't we synchronize the password between the two? But you still had two different IDs. And technically two still passwords, but it was, it was wise, I think. Exactly. But, but it was literally one was in Active Directory and one was in like Nobel Identity Manager Directory. Um, but yeah, they were, they were synchronizing passwords. So at that point, we, we still had effectively 115, 120 different ways of doing. I, I got, right. You had a central team that managed the global identity portion, but that wasn't really a global identity platform because it was really used for accessing one's websites. Over time, we got some of our major markets sort of standardized on a single active directory, but, um, it, it took us up until la end of 2022 to actually get everybody on to a standard platform, right through the same business processes, same identity lifecycle processes and everything. But we, we really kicked that up process off in 2019 and over the course of four years, we onboarded a hundred markets and something like, uh, almost 2 million user IDs on the platform in like four years. So that's what my talk is going to be about is really just kind of talking through what that process looked like, how we did it, how we structured the program to actually do that because it, it was an insane amount of work to try and work with all of these different markets to bring them on board. Um, and we obviously couldn't do it in a custom way for every single market because there was no way we could do it. Um, and then, you know, I'll talk through a, a few of the lessons learned and, and sort of what's next for, from the top. Good stuff. We've been talking here about 45 minutes, kind of the call before the store of Identiverse, it's, you know, 10, 20 AM, big yep. time because the people kind of coming and going. So we're kind of like, what do we get to that room? Right. Like a, uh, the actual conference technically, I guess, starts tonight with uh, the keynote. Um, so we want to let you get on and at least get an app in or the shenanigans start around here. Um, would you say that the sausage, egg and cheese, the griddle is the pinnacle? of McDonald's innovation. So, uh, pinnacle of McDonald's innovation. Hmm. Because I could tell you right now, I think it is. I don't know how you beat that. So I will say my kids love the sausage, egg and cheese, but girl, that is by far their favorite breakfast. Um, I'm, I'm more of a breakfast burrito kind of guy myself. Um, cause you know, what, what can be better than eggs and sausage and peppers and roll up and time? Yeah, Olivia the salsa. And yeah, there's a yeah, exactly. uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the little um, syrup injected pan shake, I, I, yeah, it, I mean, it, it literally is a whole breakfast in one sandwich. So, so yeah, I could, I could see that. I, I could, I could agree with that statement. What do you say to someone when they've never, that to make that all things say, what's the thing that they should try? Wow. I mean, he, he what, it was worse. <laughs> right. If not actually, that would be, that's not sure if he likes it. I, I mean, I, I guess it, so I think you got to go with the classics, right? It, if, if you're talking about breakfast, you gotta, you gotta try and get a, you know, you're not a lot of guy too plain. Yeah. I, I mean, I loved them when I was a kid, but now that you have the, um, the red and griddle, I mean, and, and by the way, it doesn't have to be just sauces. I mean, anything you put on a McGriddle, it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you could really try it for breakfast because the breakfast menu is awesome. And I, 
I'd miss all day breakfast. Um, but I, obviously, and for lunch, you got to cut the fries. Yeah. I mean, there, there's just no two ways around how to cut fries. Um, and I would say our poor powder with cheese, because my go to, you know, we, we switched over to fresh beef for poor powder with cheese a number of years ago. And it's like that day. Um, you, I mean, the quality of the fresh beef versus the frozen beef is just, I mean, our frozen beef is good. It's good quality. It's just, there's something about the thing. fresh beef. Crispy chicken deluxe, that's what I'm into. So how, here's what for you. Overrated or underrated? Fish fillet salad. I got to say overrated because I don't like fish very much. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I do know that there are lots of people that level. And I, it's probably underrated. I never get it. But... <laughs> I just wait a second. How can you how can you say it's underrated? I don't have to many people that like it. Okay. So I think like the rating is very low that is among society. It's gotta be better than we I just like fish. We sell an awful lot, but it's just when I get to McDonald's, I'm like, ah, well, certain things and fish sandwich doesn't come to mind for me. But yeah, I'm thinking probably <laughs> if I'll, and it's a, it's the only sandwich we have that uses a steam butt. Mm. All of our other sandwiches use toasted buns. Okay. But the fish fillet has a steamed bun. Um, I, which, it's a, I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I have to go back and look up the history, but uh, yeah, there's something about the, it makes it like super pillowy and a okay. cow. I guess maybe because the fish is kind of a lighter, a, a lighter okay. protein versus like yeah. a cucumber chicken. It's are more dense, and so because the the fish is is lighter to fluff it, I'd have to have to ask by my, my buddy Chef Mike Harris. I think it's how he pronounces his last name. He's a he's a former McDonald's chef, and he he's out on social media answering all the McDonald's questions. So I'd be doing one for throwing out TikTok or something. Yeah, like that. exactly. That's a good like uh, uh the, you know pub trivia quiz I can. Uh, well, it's the only McDonald's item that does not have a toasted one, right? Well, no. Yeah, that would be. All right. What do you think? Should we wrap it up there? I think we should wrap it up. We, uh, I mean, we can't take up too much tourist time yeah. together. Just get you know, out there. Busy day to burst ahead. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys have. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the title quests. And uh, yeah, we'll see you walk in the halls and we'll be doing the same thing. So that's appreciating time. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead and leave it there for this conversation, I think. So this is kind of kick off of our Identitors 2024 series. Uh, it's a plan, I think, right now is uh, episodes pretty much all of last week as I get back and get these out of it and kind of pushed out the door, but um, that was it. So our first four range of video, we got cameras, we got some microphones, we got open door. People were kind of coming in and not quite sure. Was it going on there? They came to this. Shoot, why? I don't know. So, uh, you know, do a live, as they say, in the biz, uh, but go ahead at the end, uh, come on in and listen to us, like, subscribe, we're building up a YouTube channel. So I know Jim is very interested in making sure that the YouTube plug out. If you did, most of them to have it. It's ready, I'm ready. So youtube.com slash at IDAC podcast, brings you to our channel. Our website, IDAC podcast.com, our Twitter X, whatever, all of the flame. At IDAZ Podcasts, Mastodon, IDAZ Podcasts at InfoSite.exchange. And yeah, we're on LinkedIn. George will have your LinkedIn as well in our show notes so that people can reach out. Awesome. Yeah, either give you grease over your, your McDonald's items or commiserate with you on the authorization stuff and, and things like that. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it. Uh, thanks for watching and or listening. And we'll talk to you on the next talk. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.